Hi all, thank you very much for joining. Maria, thank you very much for this opportunity. And I'd like to also thank Andrette for taking the initiative. Andrette is my, man my office manager and uh, she's just uh, a stalwart in my business. Um, my name is Mark Samuelson. I founded Model Art in 19 1988. It was a stopgap after having lost my previous business of 30 employees. The business ran for three years in the toughest economic times before meeting its demise. It was an era of the infamous Rubicon speech, P.W. Berta, with a country in flames and prime bank rate in its mid-20s. I was in my mid-20s. It was a bridge too far, and it was purgatory. As a student, I found model building enjoyable and easy to work, easy, and uh, working as a designer, I used models as a design tool to explore options and to test concepts and details. Without a portfolio, I hooked my wares on the understanding that I'd produce work free of charge for an agreed value. If the model did not qualify, the client would withhold payment and keep the model. Clients were always happy to pay, and the demand for my work grew exponentially. In the few years, in just a few years, now grounded in the industry, I set my sights on becoming the best in the country, whatever that meant. This was one of my first models, It was of Bruma Lake. Um, it was done off some very sketchy sketches, and um, there were no colors or anything like that, and the client asked me to just embellish and uh, do what I needed to do, which I did. And uh, it was a great hit and was almost my shoe in to the industry. I purchased my first CNC machine in 1990. The, the machine area was about an A3 and cost the equivalent of a mid-sized car. Um, the German manufacturer, Bungard, insisted that I relinquish all guarantees and warranties because it was designed to manufacture PC boards, a far more abrasive material than soft plastics our model, that our models are made of. Four months later, we finally got the dos based program to read CAD files. It was a game changer. We now operate nine state-of-the-art CNC machines and 10 3D printers, which we'll discuss a bit later. Um, before long, I aspired for model art to be the best in the world. This endorsement came in the late 1990s when Jumeirah International in Dubai identified model art as their preferred bidder after a global due diligence in the industry. Best in the world is a very subjective claim. I would never make this, but we still aspire to improve our product one project at a time. Jumeirah International, this is our first project that we did for Jumeirah International. It's called Madina Jumeirah. And um, it had a great hit with, uh, it was a great hit with Sheikh Mohammed in Dubai, who in, in that culture in those days, um, if he approved something, the word would get out very quickly. And uh, you, it was a shoe into to our industry. It was a very successful model. We went on to do the Burj Al Arab. In fact, we did three Burj Al Arab models. Um, two were roving ambassadors traveling around the whole world. In, in, in lobbies in, of, of hotels and those kinds of places, exhibition spaces. One was for the Cooper Hewitt Museum, which is the architectural wing of the Smithsonian Museum in New York. And I think it's still there, but I stand, um, I stand to correction on this. It was an interactive model. Um, you'll see at the side of the beams there, um, those, those beams are little lights. We had a whole, <clears throat> repertoire of lights from the bouncing ball to roaming around and doing all that kind of thing. It was very an animated and worked very well in, you know, to attract attention. Um, Model Arts uh, has invested more in process technology than any competitor that I'm aware of. This has been mentioned to us um, by international suppliers. Um, so, so this is, um, we've been doing this for, for years and years and years now, and um, we've been doing this for years and years, and um, primarily we, we machine, um, our, our machining processes are um, CNC routing. Now CNC routing is the exact opposite of CNC printing because CNC printing is an additive process 
and routing is a removable process where it removes material to create the result. Routing is more accurate and it has, it has more options. So CNC printing has its place, or at least 3D printing has its place, but it's more like the, um, I would term it as the, the shifting spanner of, of um, CNC. We have CNC uh, lathe turning. These are bullets that we use to index our um, presentation cases, one on top of the other. And you'll see an example of that later on. Um, it's extremely accurate and it, it makes a piece, it could make a chess piece in about a minute or two. So um, our Zunt is our flagship machine. It runs about 10 different functions of the tools that we've got um, from blade cutting, which it's doing now, to kiss cutting, it is a laser, it's got a marking pen, it's got a laser pointer, it has a router, the router turns at 60,000 RPM, which is 6,000 um, revs a minute, a second, I beg your pardon, and uh, just to envisage that is yeah, something uh, quite magnificent. We own 10 3D printers, and um, like I said, they're the shifting spanner, and um, but they're very, very useful and they're taking us into a new era. There are improvements, um, but yeah, they don't really, they're not our go-to machine when we need quality finishes and that kind of thing. We also use uh, printing techniques to, in our models. We've got large format printers and um, we also have UV printers um, for applying detail on models that is otherwise not, not possible. Um, So, um, so, so let's go into history of scale model building. Um, the early records date back into the 14th century BC. Um, models found in the pyramids, um, in the chambers in Tutankhamun's uh, burial chamber. Um, there are examples of, of what these models were. And they, they basically document um, history of time in those days. So figurines detailing people performing tasks as masons, um, as well as domestic stock. There was an emphasis on documenting boats um, in a range from personal craft fashioned from papyrus reeds lashed together in a banana shape um, with the points turned up in the ends. Um, to scaled up um, derivatives made out of timber. A lot of insight um, into the history of the day has been gleaned from these models. And I imagine that the combination of unambiguous models and objects rendered in stone um, would have offered clues to enable the deciphering of hieroglyphics. And here's an example. Um, this image is courtesy of Architon. Models have um, been foremost in the design of pyramids, prominent structures. Not only could models provide a level of proof and certainty about the scale of structures, but more importantly, will have been used to test the span structure and the detailing would enable the components of these outside structures to last for centuries as they have. The relevance of history in the model building era. There's documented evidence that models are instrumental in the advancement of design through time and our time slice it mirrors the technology of the day. Technology is normally associated with processing equipment and not much thoughts, thought is given to the developments in the technology of fa fabrication materials. Engineers understand this, many don't. So why is history relevant in the modern era? Because, because the reasons why we use models as a tool in our trade remains the same. Models are an unambiguous, tangible medium of communication and experimentation. They facilitate the assembly of, assembly of a team of professionals around a common object, thus enabling informed comment and the fast track consensus of opinion. The relevance of history in the modern era There's documented evidence. Um, let's see, I think I've done that one. Uh, 
we go. So here's an example of, of a model where you need consensus of opinion. This is an auto teller. We've done several of these projects for, for NetBank, um, where we document the, the auto teller. It's, it's, it's a branding exercise. So you'll have all of the parties come together, come up with this design. And in order to get a sign off by the board, we present a model. It's a model that is approximately the size of a shoebox and um, presented in a boardroom. Um, people can see it for what it is. Um, various directors, financial, technical, whoever is, is in on the deal um, can see it. It's tangible. There's no time wasted um, by misunderstandings and people withholding their signature. Um, the process is able to move on. Um, we've done some notable pr projects around the world, uh, namely Atlantis in Dubai. And the relevance of this image is that we, um, we did a lot of work with late Sal Kersner. And he was uh, one of the shareholders in this project. He was a uh, 50% in a JV with uh, Jumeirah International, I think it was, um, or, the, or the rulers court in Dubai. And um, the relevance of it was that he built a model on every project he ever did, because he saw that if you were to brief contractors and people who were submitting tenders in the presence of a model, in those days, people were quoting off, off reams of drawings. If we were to brief them in a, in, in a room with a model present, they would, able to, they would be able to assess the um, scope of the project and they could understand it more easily than leaving through reams and reams of drawings and not fully understanding it and putting contingency values in. And he put the figure at about a 20% saving, which is quite remarkable. I don't know this for sure. And he didn't tell me personally, but I've heard it through his office. This is just another example of it. This is a 12 meter model, about two and a half meters. Um, it's the cost of a small house in today's money, but uh, a huge amount of work went into it, as you can see. So the analogy of, an, of, of a chartered accountant, so where, where do models fit in to the professional team? So what you have in a professional team is you have, you've got multiple disciplines. You've got people who drive the design, then you've got people who assist them to get design, design to stand up, which is where you guys come in, the, the structural engineers. You've got financial people. You've got quantity surveyors. You've got all of those people that sort of sit in the same boardroom week after week, going through the process as this design process grows. So the relevance of a model is in this analogy. The analogy of a chartered accountant being able to read detail between the lines of the balance sheet, but requiring more complete embellishment of structural design to grasp the concept. And the architect able to envisage a detailed design from a simple sketch, but needing flesh on the bones of the balance sheet to understand and sign off. So there it is. So introducing a model into the design process can be an asset. And I'll take you through a little metamorphosis idea that I've, I've put together that has been successful in, in selling the concept. Um, so large structures, large structural projects, structural projects by their very nature are multidisciplinary, as I've mentioned in the previous comments. Ego of the team, leaders, and procedure of the project track one another in equal measure. Ego is a barrier to admitting fault and a lack of understanding. The design is referred back for more detail and revision Time is lost, costs are incurred, client ego invariably trumps the sum of all the egos in the design team. And much of the added cost is borne by the consultants. And I'm sure you guys can appreciate that um, because that's certainly been my experience um, in, in, in being witness to all of these. I've just lost my way a bit there. Um, in bearing witness to this. So, where there are multiple specialists in a single discipline, and whilst computer systems have um, become nimble, the introduction of subsets of expertise adds complexity to the needs uh, that needs to be understood by the rest of the team. Um, the added inertia adds delays. So in other words, when designs get to a certain stage, it then gets halved off to other areas of specialists. You know, for example, the air conditioners come in at a later stage or the, those types of things. So um, the air condition consultants. The relevant model shows no bias. 
The relevant model shows no bias to any particular set of expertise. It's unambiguous and representative of what it needs to be at any point in the duration of a project. Work in progress in the design models are an antidote to the curse of ego. So in other words, if you can get a model to track the design process, as used to happen in the engineering industry when they used to design process plants, there's a far bigger understanding by all the consultants as to where we are and there are less questions and there's a higher level of consensus of opinion. Um, so this is a, a project that would attract a lot of ego and uh, this is the world's tallest building before Burj Khalifa. We built it, um, it's just gonna stand on the Palm uh, Jumeirah um, in, 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 in some central place um, at the entrance to it. But it was shelved because there wasn't, whilst the design was very sought after and approved, um, there wasn't sufficient technology in steel and concrete at the time to make this project viable. So it is a 1,500 meters, it's, it's, it's a mile high building. So models may be used to flesh out concepts um, in the landscape for a client, a metamorphosis of subsequent models that requires more detail, mirroring the evolution of the design. Um, has primary benefit of focusing attention to all inward, um, to focusing all attention concerned inward with a better chance of consensus. And here's an example of that. So the site starts with the green fields. So it's an open site. The, 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 the client has purchased the site and it needs to be built on. The client happens to have multidisciplinary uh, practice um, there may be a, an admin component, a manufacturing component, whatever it is, but it's decided that there are four buildings that need to go onto this particular site. Um, so what we do is with our CNC machines, we're able to replicate the earth plate exactly so that we can then make the next incarnation in our studio and progress it to the next stage. So it, could, it then moves onto a new stage where the detail and the embellishment gradually starts to add on as layers, as consensus in the boardroom happens. So there's no ifing and butting, there's no um, misunderstanding of what the information that is being shared and people being sent back to do revision after revision after revision. Um, it, it, it more or less closes the, the trajectory of, of the project. A good example of this was in the Waterfall City project where, um, each of the earth lift out. Um, the, the models that are in full color are um, as built or approved and currently under construction. The models that were in, in monochrome, uh, semi-detail, were concepts that were being bandied around. Um, you'll, you'll notice um, the circa, uh, the, those circa um, buildings, the, the apartment buildings were, um, you know, under review at the time, they're now being built. And um, the idea was to pop the island out and transfer the, the new incarnation into it, which we did. Um, but the CEO has since, since moved on and uh, the team has lost its appetite to upgrade this. And uh, that's, that's where that is. But the, the, tool, the tool survives nonetheless. Um, so the value of this is that you're able to Hold on to the base, which is a massive part of the cost, because one has got to take in, uh, into account the undulation of the land, all those kinds of things, and simply upgrade it by doing upgrading incrementally as the focus areas come on stream. Okay, so um, models in the context of competing media. So we compete with a lot of other media. We compete with renders and we compete with video and all those, those kinds of things as well. But they're all different. They're not exclusive, but they almost help each other out uh, because they, they attract different audiences and have got different strengths in the same way that radio and television do. So just noticing the difference between them um, is, is, is quite an important thing. So a model is a physical object that enables the content to be absorbed in one's own time, on one's own terms. So in other words, an accountant would be able to see a model in terms of the financial aspects of it. The engineer would see the, 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 uh, 
sort of structural um, issues or challenges and areas that may look a bit thin or over 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 spec or whatever it is. Um, and so it goes down and um, that's what it does. So each of the expertise sees, sees it through their own lens. The model cannot document a handsome couple at the entrance of an exclusive address. That job's done by a picture. It's powerful, but what's on the page is all you get. A model is incapable of documenting the, the pleasure of experience in the exclusive address. Video does this. When marketing a project um, to guests and visitors in combination of all three is the most powerful. And we find this in places like Dubai where the, where the budgets are big. So they'll do, um, there'll be a lot of uh, print imagery um, and a lot of video alongside the model. But we find that the gatherings happen around the model. Um, projects that we've done, um, I'm going to now move into, into, into projects that we've done and that are sort of relevant to um, structural engineering and why we do them. So this is a, an, an, an oil rig um, done for a company called IMI, which is a part of the Saudi um, 2030 vision. Um, and it is the biggest, going to be the biggest shipyard in the world. So they've attracted a lot of internal international investors like Hyundai, shipbuilders out of out of um, Holland, um, Halliburton, and, and 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 quite quite a few massive um, industrialists are all gathering at at this one place. And this is just one of the product offerings that they're going to be manufacturing at this. And that was the model was there as part of an exhibition in um, Saudi Arabia and Abu Dhabi to um, add interest in, in, and to get people into the stand. It's at scale one in a hundred. It's an explicitly detailed model, as you can see. And it stands about the, the it's about one and a half meters wide, about one and a half meters. And it probably stands about a meter high. Um, this is more along the line of structural engineering. It, it's a project in, um, in, the, in the old Transcar or Eastern Cape. Um, and it's part of that new road that is going to straddle the, or at least trace the, the coastline. And uh, this is the Intento Bridge. It's infamous because uh, the contractor was a German, the, the contractor who was awarded was a German contractor. And uh, they packed up tools when the um, politicians and people arrived on site, the, 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 the so-called um, construction mafia arrived and the Germans packed up and left, which, and I'm not sure whether that has been resolved. And uh, that's, it's a great pity, but it's a very, very nice model and we're happy to have been awarded this project. This year is probably more interesting to most structural engineers. And uh, this is the Msakaba Bridge on the same river, on the same route. Um, we built two models of this. One is on site as a sort of almost a, a, a briefing platform for onboarding people in, in, in the industry. And um, the, a complex model, it's three meters long. It's one in 500. Um, the quite a difficult model to build and, and I'll, I'll explain why now. So you'll notice the, um, all the cables um, are to scale. If you, if you look at the bottom of, 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 of on the right hand side there, you'll notice that they're accurate, accurately scaled to the, the, um, the actual bridge scale. And you'll notice there's a camber on the bridge as well. And I'm not sure if camber is the right word, but it does, it, 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 it naturally slopes upwards and then downwards. It's about two, it's about two meters um, from the pylon to pylon. The, the difference is about two meters in real life. And um, this model presented a lot of problems. The first one was that the base needed to be absolutely inflexible because if the base flexed at all, these cables would go soft on the one side and, 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 and would become taut on the other side. Would become taut on the other side. And um, so that was an issue. Um, the, the, the bridge, the span of the bridge was at one in 500 is uh, at least the discrepancy of, of um, 
the ramp up on the bridge and ramp down is about four millimeters. And we had to get this right. So we we made that out of carbon fiber with a sandwich um, structure in between to, to achieve that. And even then we had a difficult time getting it to work. So we had to pinch it between the ends um, of, you know, where, where, where the structure meets the pylons to get that to be accurate. Um, you'll notice the, the where, where the cables are anchored in the ground and onto the pylon, um, each has got a, a type of a ferrule or a, um, I'm not sure if on, on that scale, if you would call it a crimp, but probably a crimp. And um, so those all are to be accurately drilled at the right angle um, on, on, on both ends, pylon as well as on the ground. And then the, the main issue was how do we make the cables? That is a very big issue for us because the cables, um, we initially set out to use elastic bands, the type of elastic that they weave into, into underwear and uh, sort of stretch fabrics and things like that. So, um, and you can get those at different sizes and we're able to source all of those. But the quantity of um, putting all of those elastics in tension to give you the right effect meant that it was going to be lifting about five kilograms of weight collectively over all of those things. So that was an idea that we had to abandon. The next idea went on to using um, piano wire at the correct scale. And some of the weight of the piano wire was between five and 10 kilograms. So that had the opposite effect. So we were really stymied and uh, we had a deadline to meet and uh, we yeah, weren't sure how to go about it. Eventually somebody came up in our studio or with taking fiber optics or at least carbon fiber and um, pulling it out in its, uh, pulling the weaves out one at a time, combining them and winding them up and then encapsulating that in, in, in epoxy glue. That gave us a very lightweight, perfectly straight um, cable, which in this case is correct, although the, because the cables do um, tend to, to bow in real life. but. Um, so that was a, a really good discovery and we were able to do that. So quite a difficult model to build, but a very rewarding process from a thought point of view, as well as from a, a you know, problem solving point of view. And the result is good, the client's very happy. And that's how they're presented in the standard offices in um, Gorbeka. This is a recent project that we just finished and uh, very much a subject of conversation in South Africa at the moment. Um, it's a solar array um, where you've got these mirrors. You've got 600 hectares of mirrors, or 660 hectares of mirrors that focus onto a um, to the tip of the tower where you've got a heat exchanger. Salt is pumped up from a reservoir at the base of, of, of the structure into the heat exchanger and back down again to where it sits at a, at a temperature of about uh, 760 degrees. Um, we, um, the back of the, the, the model was cut away and we used a, a system of lights that uh, uh, traced the process up and down um, in, a, in, a, in an animated way to show, what, to show what happens. Some of the roofs have been removed to show the plant, the process plant and that kind of thing as well. Um, so there you have it again. So you're able to see the, the whole presentation and um, this type of model is invaluable for those kinds of things. So basically it's modeling the, the, the project when it's complete, but um, it has its benefits and, and uh, very place an order of 200 corporate gifts which were miniatures of these were there. This is another technical issue, a technical problem where, um, or, or technical concept that needed to be showed, shown through the, through the medium of the model. What it is, is that in this particular part of the plat reef, um, the, the, the ore body is not just a fine seam, it's, it's a 50 meter band of ore. 
And so the the the, the company um, Ivan Ivanho Ivan Platz has taken the um, the approach of um, excavating on two levels, excavating tunnels on two levels, drilling from above, and collecting the blasting and collecting the ore body from below. So um, it's it's a technology that gets used in copper mines. I know it was used in Palabora where we built a model, but um, yeah, it's it's it, it is a unique uh, way of doing it in in mines like gold and, and copper. And was sent to and the directors in of the same company in the respective countries could meet around in a boardroom and discuss the model and and and, and aspects of the mining. Um, that needed to be discussed at that time. So um, it was very valuable in that, in that sense. We do a lot of work for Denel. Um, a lot of the work we, we are not able to show, but this is in the public domain. We This was a prototype during the construction phase, during the design phase of, of the, the, the um, seeker plane. Um, it's a third scale, and it has a wingspan of about, ooh, must be about four meters, I think. So in fact, longer than four meters, um, it can fly. And um, it's still um, used today. And uh, this is about 12 years old now, the, 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 the actual craft. Um, Mount Edgecombe Interchange in KZN. Um, SMEC, um, who are the designers and uh, all the, I think they're the, the, the main consultants, design engineers on that, consulting engineers. They, um, ordered one and one went to the client for this particular interchange. It was of importance to them and it needed to be marketed and, and that kind of thing. So um, I think it was also in collaboration with a lot of the property owners in the area who saw benefit in um, what the new interchange would bring. So this was done a few years ago. This is a, a, a project that we did for Formscaf. And it documents, it's at a scale of one in 50, and it documents all of their um, structures and, and, and the parts that go into, into their systems of, um, of scaffolding. Um, it's not evident in this, in this image, but we were, able, we, showed, we were able to show a metamorphosis where aspects of it were already being built, the interiors were, were being put in on the lower floor, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see how the progression happens from the lower floor that is, yeah, complete to the upper floor, which is um, getting shuttering installed and that type of thing. We do a lot of work for um, for engineering companies or, or for, for, for companies who, who've got technical um, requirements. So this is a model of, of a data center. Um, it's, it's a carbon copy of many others around the country. It's a, it's, I think it's, it's, it's a modular system. And um, the purpose of the model was to help people understand what these systems are all about and uh, how they work. So, and it was all color coded. The yellow tubing was um, is fiber optic and all that kind of thing. So, you've got all the layering that goes into one of these um, the, these centers. Um, this is a model to um, respond to a problem um, with a coal mine. Um, so this coal mine, as all coal mines do, and all mines rack up massive costs with um, onboarding of staff, uh, briefing uh, students, interns, briefing public, briefing um, whoever. Um, so the traditional way is to, when you visit the mine, you go through security, go through all your checks, you hand in your computers, put on your safety boots, overall that they provide, hard hats, all these things, nothing fits. It's embarrassing for women. And um, that's how, how it was traditionally done. And then you've got a chaperone who's qualified. He knows the safety rules. He, the, the mine is forewarned to expect you. Uh, trucks need to buy, be diverted. It's a, it's a massive cost. And so we de developed this model showing every aspect of that mining process. Um, from the uh, uh, soil removal in the and stockpiling in the foreground, 
in, on the left hand side through to the um, the mine, the blasting, um, the drag line, et cetera, et cetera. And then the recovery process on the right hand side. It went on to the process plant, which was indicated with arrows to show um, where all the minerals go. And um, one out to Richards Bay and the other out to the nearest power station. It was a very successful model. I think it's, it's, it's the length is about eight meters, I think I recall. So um, yeah, a very successful model too. This is work during work in progress. So you can see a bit of untidiness around there. Also the same thing, um, an engineering structure, a beautiful engineering structure, I have to say. And some of the, I have a preference for engineering structures to architecture. In fact, in my, my, the person who I most admire is Calatrava, the Spanish engineer, architect, whatever you want to call him. And, uh, so yeah, it's, a, it's an appreciation for that, but we're able to document this thing at very at a very high level of resolution, as you can see. And it was at the time of the World Cup and built for the World Cup as part of the marketing, but also the onboarding of VIPs and that kind of thing. Car train, we did this in the very early days, um, just showing a section through Sanford Station and um, typically how it functions and many of us will be familiar with that. This model went to London and we had a replica stay in South Africa. Ryan Metal Dinell. So this is a, um, a mobile field hospital and um, it's, it operates completely off the grid. It's got hydrogen gas, it's got solar, it's got uh, lithium batteries, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And this was purely to show how the modules worked as part of a promotional thing. And this is a roving ambassador for, for the company. We do work for a company called um, Guardia, who bought out Betafe in South Africa. They do um, security systems and uh, for anything and everything, airports, um, harbors, um, mil military installations, uh, oil rigs, land oil rigs, all those kinds of things with this value. And there's the, um, opportunistic, uh, they're at risk of opportunism by, you know, people who, who, who don't agree with them. So we um, we modeled this, it's an absolutely accurate model, it's beautifully detailed. And also this travels around the world. Um, Guardia is based in Texas, in Fort Worth. We've done a whole lot of models for them and uh, they, they're happy with our product. Another product for Guardia, this is a, a, a data center. Um, we, we incorporated some audio video into the facade of the model, and that was quite interesting too. So that that's um, that was yeah, and it worked really really well. By the way, data centers have got the one dilemma: is they cannot be insured. Nobody will touch them with insurance, so they need to have all of these um, extra layers of. Um, and this is what these com this company specializes in. Walters Harbour at one in uh, 1,000. It's about one and a half meters by about 1.2 meters. It just shows a concept. So the concept is about wetting people's appetite and showing the potential for something that's not there. So um, we do a lot of that kind of thing. Also a concept, and this went on to be built. This was to study the facade of the Dubai Opera House. And you can see it's a very audacious structure and uh, just the, the structures to support all that glass work was just phenomenal. So it would be worth just Googling the Dubai Opera House and seeing what a majestic structure it is. We do work for, this was also part of the IMI, which is the, um, uh, the shipyard project. And uh, so um, we did an overall model of this, of, of this showing all the activities of shipbuilding from oil rigs on the left-hand side, engine building, all that kind of thing. It was an interactive model as well. And uh, there were lights that came on and off showing zones and that type of thing. Purely uh, a, 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 a communication tool and to show intent, attract investors and all that kind of thing. So that's where the power of this model came in. We do a lot of corporate gifts. Um, in this case, this was a, 
Commodus, which is a German company. We do we do work for they 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 were bought up on a company called Tomra, and um, it's now Tomra. But these machines still exist. This is a diamond sorting machine, a conveyor belt of uh, alluvial pebbles. Pebbles will um, end up on the on the, on the shaker plate on the right. That that sort of wedge shaped gray structure, and the pebbles will rattle down all the way to the bottom into almost like a, a waterfall of, of, of pebbles. And the diamonds fluoresce. So on the, the, on the ends are the cameras. You'll see these, the, on, on each end, you've got two identical cameras with the handles on. Those cameras capture the fluorescence in the diamond as it falls through. And you get a jet of air that dispatches that particular pebble into a, a particular hopper. So um, it's, Apparently, it's, 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 it's a great win for everyone. And corporate gifts are one way to get your brand into your client, your, 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 into, the C, into the office of the CEO, um, of somebody who you've done business with. And uh, they're not cheap to make because they're beautifully done. They're highly uh, accurate. And um, a model like this wouldn't fit in a shoebox, but just about. But uh, yeah. When you amortize it over numbers, as our client did, we would they would place an order for 30 at a time. It becomes easier. And with CNC machining process and that kind of thing, you're able to do it fairly quickly and bring the cost down. So I think that ends my um my presentation.